you are already acquainted with our, our dear brother, Dan Grant. And every Wednesday, for 10 presentations, he has been uh, fearlessly, courageously, with all his heart, sharing and leading us to understand and to grasp and making appeals concerning every topic you have heard. It takes a lot to prepare for this. It's a time on, on, on your knees, time in meditation and study, time in personal reflection too. Not only does the person who speak to others uh, find themselves subject to analyze what they're going to say, but it's also self-examination. And uh, we're grateful. Jesus said to his own disciples that even when they found that they connected and they did something like this in partnership with God, and there's joy to be in partnership with God. Amen. Jesus said, rejoice above all things that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. And so that is so vital. We're grateful. We've been lifting you up, Brother Dan. And uh, at this moment, as you come and share the message for this evening, the Godhead, we're grateful to the Lord for what He has been doing. And may He continue in your life, not only tonight, but always. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, church. Good evening. Good evening. Ten weeks. Are you glad it's over? Amen. <laughs> 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 okay, honesty is the best policy. <laughs> honesty is the best policy. Um, and in spite of that, I, I, Pastor's right, I, I've enjoyed this. It's been a period of self-examination for me. And, uh, and, and I hope for you. I hope that you, uh, you've got something out of these meetings that will help you in your walk with Christ for the rest of your life. Uh, I believe that's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. Amen. What are we talking about tonight? Does anybody know? Godhead. Everybody, what are we talking about tonight? Godhead. This, this particular topic is, is no less important than all the others uh, that we've talked about for the last last nine weeks prior to this one. Um, and again, uh, there's absolutely not enough time to give you everything that is involved in 30, 35 minutes. But uh, what the Lord has placed on our heart tonight, we're going to share. And, and by His grace, as a result, at the end of it, we'll know a little more. We'll be a little bit richer. And some of the questions that I know that some of you have will be answered. Tonight. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, eternal God, blessed Savior. I thank you. I do praise you, Lord. I give you all the glory. Pour out your spirit upon each of us tonight, Father, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Go with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And I'm going to read this verse. Now, Rob has got it on the board. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines God as three divine persons. How many people? Three. Three divine persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. The three persons are distinct, yet are one substance, essence, or the nature. A nature, brethren, is what one is. Everybody say that. A nature is what one is. Say it after me. Say it after me. A nature is what one is. While a person is who one is. 
while a person is fooled by it. I want you to remember that. The Trinity, the Trinity, the Godhead is a mystery of Christian faith. The word Trinity was first formally used at the Synod. Um, the Synod is historically uh, a council of the church um, where they, dis they decide upon things like the doctrine we're talking about tonight. Uh, the church leaders get together and, uh, and they talk about things like the Trinity and they make a decision on where this will fit into the theology of the church. So the Trinity was first formally used at the Synod uh, and this particular Synod was held in Alexandria in AD 317. AD 317. And at that time, the word Trinity took its place in the language of Christian theology for the first time in a biblical work of a fellow by the name of Theophilus, who at that time was the bishop of Antioch in Syria from AD 168 to AD 183. So the first time, the first time that the Trinity was formally used was during that period. Now, According to this doctrine, the Trinity, the Godhead, there is only one God and three persons. How many gods? One God and three persons. Each person is God, whole, entire, and complete. Each person. They're distinct, readily distinguishable from one another in their relations and origins. It is the Father, the brethren, who generates. The Father generates. The Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds. Although distinct in their relations with one another, they are one in everything else. Somebody say amen. amen. The entire work of creation and grace is a single operation common to those three divine persons who at the same time operate according to their unique properties so that all things are from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. The three persons that we're talking about are co-equal, they're co-eternal, and consubstantial. In Trinitarian doctrine, God exists as how many people? Three persons, but it's how many beings? One. One being. That is, has a single divine nature. Now, the members of the Trinity, uh, co-eco, as we said, and co-eternal, they're one in essence, in nature, in power, action, and will. They're one in everything. Okay? The Father, the Father is uncreated. Say that after me. The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. All right. All three are eternal with no beginning and no end. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. The Father is God. The Son, Jesus Christ, is God. The Holy Spirit, brethren, is God. Three gods, but only one God. Yet, three persons, as we said, in essence. Brethren, this, this, this is what is known as divine mathematics, where one makes three, and three makes one. Hmm? Someone said, someone said, our narrow thoughts can no more comprehend the Trinity in unity that a nutshell can hold all the water in the oceans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not three different names for different parts of God, but one name for God. Because all three persons exist in God as a unity. The Father cannot be divided from the Son, nor the Holy Spirit divided from the Son. It is understood that each person has an identical essence or nature, not merely similar natures. They're identical. 
Are you with me? Are you with me, folks? Amen. Now, I, I want to I wanna talk about something here, but, but before I get into that, I want to I say this. Uh, I want to quote. I want to quote our prophetess. Okay? And I want you to listen carefully, all right? Ellen White said, Ellen White said, she said, our policy is not to make prominent the objectional features of our faith, mm -hmm. which strike most decidedly against the practices and customs of our people. Until the Lord shall give the people a fair chance to know that we are believers in Christ, that we do believe in the diversity of Christ and in his pre-existence. Mm. Testimonies to Ministers, page 253. I want to say that. I want you to let that sink in. Okay? Now I'm going to go on. I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue. The word Trinity, as all of us know, it does not appear in the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. It does not appear in the Word of God. As I said earlier, it was first used at the Sinai in Alexandria in AD 317. However, however, listen to this, the teaching of the Trinity is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are three separate but interrelated types of evidence for the Trinity or triunity of God in Scripture. The first one is, there is evidence for the unity of God that is God is one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second one is there is evidence that uh, the evidence that there are three persons who are God. And then there are a subtle number three, subtle textual hints of God's three in oneness. Three in oneness. I want, I want you to get as much of this as you possibly can. The belief system, the belief systems of ancient Israel was rigorously, rigorously monotheistic. Monotheistic. Mono expressing one. And theistic from, from the Greek word for God. Meaning that there is only one true God. This position is unwavering throughout the Old Testament. Moses declared in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, that the Lord our God is one God. Hmm? Our, the Lord our God is one God. In Mark 12, 29, Jesus quoted this and said it was the first commandment of all. Jesus said that. Somebody should have said amen. As Christians then, you and I, brethren, we are monotheistic. Huh? We believe in the existence of one God and in the oneness of God. Yet, however, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 19 to baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Hmm? This indicates, brethren, this indicates that there are three persons in one. We're monotheistic. We believe in one God. However, Jesus said there are three persons in one. I want you to, I want you to do something. I want you to go with me. Robert, I don't know if I gave you this one. I want to go to Exodus. I want to go to Exodus chapter 3. And I want to read from... Um, Verses 13 through 15. Did I give you that one? Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. The implication of God's oneness was expressed to Moses by God. And Moses said unto God, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I want you to listen to this. 
Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. By the way, by the way, we, we, we all know that in the eyes of God, marriage is a sacred, holy union. Amen? Amen. But did you know, did you know that the same Hebrew word, ichat, for one, that is used in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord God is one, is the same used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Did you know that? It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Two persons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is implied that the oneness of who he is with the Son and the Spirit, he being God, said that this name, this oneness of the Holy Trio, is his memorial to all generations. Mm -hmm. So, because of the word used for one in the original language is the same word, there is no question in my mind. In his letter to the Hebrews, in his letter to the Hebrews, in 
chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He spoke of Christ's divinity with authority as he plainly expressed. But to the Son he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Mm. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Mm. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, had anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. I'm talking about the Trinity. I'm talking about the Godhead. You hear what I'm talking to you about? This is more important than you can imagine. We're not going into the kingdom unless we get this, unless we understand this. The four Gospels, the four Gospels are loaded with evidence that revealed that Jesus understood who he was. He said over and over again that he possessed that which alone belonged to God. Hmm? In Matthew 13, 41, he spoke of the angels as his angels. You remember, you read it. In Mark 2, 5, chapter 2, 5 through 10, he forgave sins. And in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, he said he had the power to judge the world. Only God could rightfully make that claim. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> Listen to what the scriptures reveal to us. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Listen carefully. Focus with me, brother. Focus with me. I love you. You know that? In Matthew, Matthew 3, 16, at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, descended upon him. Descended upon Jesus at his baptism. Okay? In verse 17, a voice from heaven, God the Father, spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus was baptized. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. God spoke and said, This is my Son who I love. The text reads, he saw the heavens open. He, Jesus, 
Mark describes the heaven as parting on this powerful occasion. Verse 10, the New King James Version, okay? He described the heavens as parting. However, however, I discovered in the NIV a better translation was found when the heavens are torn apart. They're torn open. All three members of the Godhead were there and that powerful presentation had a powerful impact on nature itself. The heavens were torn apart as God descended upon God and God spoke to God. Amen. The work of the Holy Spirit is linked with the actions of God. There is a method to all that they do. Let's look at some of them. Let's look at some of these actions. In Luke chapter 1 verse 35, in announcing the birth of Christ, the angels tell Mary that her child would be called, be called holy because the Holy Spirit will come upon her. In Matthew 12, 28, Jesus drove out demons by the Spirit of God. In John 14, 16, the Spirit who is to carry on Christ's work after his departure is another counselor of the same kind. These are the actions I'm telling you about. In John 20, 22, Jesus breathed out the Holy Spirit upon his followers. In John 14, 17, new Christians will have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, Christ and the Holy Spirit Jesus is God. There is no question 
believe this, if you believe the word of God, then you know that Jesus is God. This is, this is not a debate. This is not a question. It's here. It's no reason for debate or question. It's here. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. God the Father. God. In the gospel, and I'm, 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 I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close. Almost 8 o'clock. In the gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16, 14, 15, and 16, you will find the most extensive concentrations of references to the cold, equal, three-person God. In John, the inner dynamics among the Trinity come through repeatedly. The doctrine of the Trinity, far from being a piece of abstract speculation, is the inevitable conclusion that comes from a systematic survey of Scripture. A systematic survey of this. And you will know without question that Jesus is God. And, 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 and it, is, it, it is without question important in, in, in this context the deity, the deity of Christ. If Christ were not fully God, then all we have is the Lord shifting the punishments of our sins from one person to another and as opposed to taking them upon himself. It's just a shifting uh, from my sins to you. You to me. There's no salvation in that. Listen, listen, listen. The heart of the gospel is this. If you don't remember anything else I said tonight, remember this. Remember this. The heart of the gospel is that it was God himself on the cross bearing the sins of the world. It was God on the cross suffering for your sins and my sins. Anything short of that, anything short of that, would strip the atonement of everything that made it so powerful and effective. Look, look, this is it, this is it. Remember this, if it's at all possible. Remember this, when we speak of the three persons of the Godhead, the word persons, what word did I say? Persons. Must be understood in a theological sense. If we equate human personality with God, we would say that three persons means three individuals. But then there would be three gods. And that would be tritheism. Three gods. Historically, Christianity has given the word person, when used of God, a special meaning, a personal self-distinction without destroying the concept of oneness, three being one. And I know, I, I know this, this idea is not easy to grasp or explain, but, but it's part of the mystery, brother. That is the Godhead. Yeah. It's part of that history. Yeah. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming out. Mm. Night after night. It shows that you have a desire mm. to get a little something so that you can help equip others Amen. for the kingdom of God. Amen. And, and I am so grateful for that. And, and at this time, we, we're going to have our our appeal song from Sandra and Shireen. I think she wants to speak to you. We strengthen you, but in my aloneness up here. Right? Okay. It's up to you, Shireen. <laughs> let's stand, let's stand, and let's sing this song together. I have some closing words after. After, after the song, yeah. I would appreciate if you all do sing along. Yeah. It will help you. <laughs> Thank you.
you know, while we're waiting on the words, I, I just want to, I just want to give Sandra and, and Shireen props for finding this music that was perfect for these meetings, That's right. and for coming out each night to to lead out in this appeal song to help us out. It's, it's just been tremendous. Amen. I, I think there's been times we could have skipped the sermon completely and gone straight to the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <clears throat>
This was all intentional. The message was on the Godhead. These meetings are intentional. The focus is that a house that is divided cannot stand. Amen. Our Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not divided. Amen. Nor can we. That is why these messages have been to help us to see the beauty, the unity of the Word of God. Amen. So that we can rejoice in the hope that was committed to us. Amen. So that we can then turn around with full assurance knowing who we belong to. Amen. Who do we represent? Amen. And we can tell others there is hope. Amen. In a world of uncertainty and insecurity, there is hope. Yes. And we have a message of hope. Amen. For our God, no matter what shifts here or there, it's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. And so, to see this work continue, I want to invite you to come in the same spirit you've been coming Amen. every Wednesday. And there's be, there will be a series of meetings. I want to bring to you material that has been produced by 3ABN, a dear friend, Alex Schussler. He is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who happens to be Jewish and very much clearly Grounded in the very words and understanding of the Hebrew Bible, both the Old and the New. And he has done a series of presentations called Back to Our Roots. Amen. We're not going to begin next Wednesday, but I'm inviting you to come next Wednesday. We're still going to have time together. The following will begin with 13, one of 13 presentation, Back to Our Roots. And you are going to be blessed. I know we're going to enjoy it together. Amen. Dan, thank you for allowing the Lord to work in and through you as his vessel to bring these messages to us. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Let us come to the Lord then in prayer. Father, I thank you. That in your great wisdom and knowledge of all things, you also had it laid out. That as a congregation on our Wednesday evening prayer meetings, we would have this series. Thank you that you placed it in your servant's heart. That you also brought it to us. That we have been through an experience of seeing how you have no uncertainty. You are solid, you are balanced, you are clear, and you want us to be grounded in you. May your spirit go with us this evening. Thank you for the offering as well tonight that is taken up to further help in the ongoing work that you've called us to. And may you bless your servant, Dan Grant, and all of our elders and all of our leaders and this congregation as we also return to our roots Amen. in Jesus.